Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Zella, Respina, and Thaspis 47 to 46 BCE by Historia Civilis. So last time we saw the Siege of Alexandria, which was basically a little side mission Caesar went on and almost got himself killed or defeated several times. Now that he's done with that whole business, uh, you know, back to the Roman Civil War. Pompey has been defeated and assassinated, but the Civil War is still continuing. Now, the Pompeians don't stand much of a chance without their leader, uh, but Caesar still has some of this mess to clean up. So I'm excited to get into that. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. It was late in the year 47 BCE, and mm. Julius Caesar had just barely survived the Siege of Alexandria by yep. installing a Roman ally on the Egyptian throne. Yeah, just barely survived is uh, exactly the right way to put it. He had prevailed against Pompey in the Roman Civil War a year earlier, but as reality set in, it was becoming clear that his victory was shallower than originally thought. While Caesar was busy in Egypt, the old order in their various forms began to creep back in and fray at his conquests. Mm. This fraying allowed three major crises to emerge. I mean, look, you know, Caesar crossed the Rubicon, began this civil war with Pompey, and even before that, Rome was in a lot of political turmoil. Uh, the civil war only accelerated that. So yeah, Caesar has beaten Pompey, um, maybe feeling like he brought the Civil War to an end. But in reality, it's been a year since then, uh, and there's still a lot of fires to put out. There's still many crises across the Empire. You know, stuff is really not settled down. Caesar needs to make his way around the Empire, you know, his Empire, uh, deal with all these issues, uh, and try to enforce some stable governance to, you know, sort of get rid of all this instability that Rome has been dealing with for a couple years. First, an allied foreign king turned against Rome in hopes of recapturing his father's lost territory. Interesting. Second, politicians back in Rome were up to their old tricks, using street violence to push for radical political reform. I'm curious to see how Caesar handles that, because Caesar is obviously, or has been, a reformer. So, well, I mean, I don't know if he... Uh, will be necessarily super in favor of the instability brought about by that street violence. He is a reformer, and he has traditionally been in support of the reform faction. Um, so I'm curious to see how that goes, how the political situation in Rome is recovering. Third, a recalcitrant Pompeian faction under the leadership of Cato had begun the process wow. of rebuilding. In of course, Cato is still hanging on. Uh, we've talked about sort of the difference between Cicero and Cato before, how Cicero was often willing to be diplomatic, be practical, whereas Cato was an arch-conservative, uh, and he stuck to his principles, honestly, regardless of the consequences. I, I would say uh, that has led to several negative consequences, um, but he does it nonetheless. North Africa. It was looking like Caesar would have to win the Civil War for a second time. Yeah. But first things first, a foreign king had invaded a Roman province. If Caesar simply ignored this threat, drumming up political support for anything else would become extremely difficult. Yeah, I mean, Caesar, you know, he's not the emperor, uh, and he's not even uh, framing himself as the emperor, but he's the, the leading man of Rome, the leading politician of the empire. Uh, he can't let this stand. That's a serious challenge to his authority. So, off to Asia Minor. The king in question was a guy named Pharnaces of Bosporus, one of the sons of Mithridates the Great. Mm. Ever the opportunist, Pharnaces went rogue during the Civil War and captured a huge chunk of Roman territory. I respect Departing that. Departing Egypt, Caesar set a breakneck pace up the Mediterranean coast, foregoing supplies for the sake of speed. Pharnaces knew that Caesar was dealing with a whole bunch of crises at once, and so offered Caesar a few minor concessions if he would just agree to leave him alone. <laughs> Not only did Caesar reject this offer, but he rejected any further offers to negotiate. 
Egypt, Damn. if you remember. He had just given away an entire Roman province in a negotiated settlement with the Queen of Egypt. So it would be a pretty bad look if he turned around and did the exact same thing with a foreign invader. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty rare for the Romans to give up territory. Uh, they are an expansionist empire, uh, and they have been for a while at this point, you know. Uh, from the origin in Rome, they've expanded throughout the Italian peninsula and then beyond. So it is pretty rare until sort of the latter days of the empire for Rome to be giving up territory, especially voluntarily. There would be no negotiated peace. Ooh. Caesar advanced further and further into Asia Minor. Eventually, Caesar and Pharnaces encountered each other near the town of Zella. The two armies deployed across a steep valley, each on their own separate hill. This would be the beginning of a weeks or even months long process where each side would engage in subtle maneuvers in hopes of gaining a slight tactical advantage. Caesar was uniquely good at this aspect of warfare. And yeah, I think, I mean, we've talked about this before. I think Historia Civilis might have used that exact phrase before. Caesar was very good at this aspect of warfare, uh, of this sort of dance between the two armies before the battle. Caesar was good at maneuvering, repositioning. He was particularly good at getting in his opponent's head, reading what his opponent was going to do, uh, and sort of playing with that expectation, you know, using mind tricks. Caesar, I mean, he's really a master of that. It's one of his greatest skills. And it's fair to assume that he was walking in there with a fairly detailed game plan. But Pharnaces had something else in mind. Okay. His first move was to have his army advance straight down the hill and into the valley. We are told that when Caesar saw this, he burst out laughing. He turned <laughs> to his advisors and told them that this was an extremely obvious fake out and that Pharnaces must think that they were a bunch of idiots. If Interesting. So Pharnaces, he's going for the strategy of uh, he's doing something which appears foolish on its face but he's actually committing to it. Um, and, you know, well, it seems like he's committing to it. If he does what I think he's going to do, which is just keep pushing, Caesar's going to be left kind of looking like an idiot. Um, so perhaps Pharnaces has overcome Caesar's mind games just with a straightforward frontal assault. I guess we'll see. If he thought that some weird aggressive posturing would scare them off their hill. But when Pharnaces' army reached the foot of the Roman hill, they didn't turn back. Yep. One imagines the smile fading from Caesar's face. <laughs> All I do, you know, I do appreciate that strategy because Pharnaces is approaching this situation. I'm sure he's heard of Caesar's reputation. He knows this dance the two armies engage in before they fight. And he's basically saying, I don't want to deal with it. I just want to get straight to the battle. Uh, and Caesar's not prepared for that. All of his preparation was for naught. The entire campaign would come down to this moment. Wow. The Romans sounded the alarm. The majority of Caesar's army were off in the distance, building the camp, but there were just enough legionaries milling about to throw together a crude, disorganized line. I mean, look, the Romans are not ready. This is a bad situation to be in. But as I've said many times before, you know, the Roman legionaries, these are some of the best disciplined, most skilled soldiers of the ancient world. Um, if I would trust any force of men to stand up to a vastly numerically superior army, uh, it would be the legionaries. When Pharnaces' army charged, this line was there to meet them. The Roman line buckled. Uh-oh. For a moment, there was panic behind the Roman lines, as it looked as if they were going to be completely overrun. Fortunately for the Romans, the moment passed, as legionaries from the camp were able to reinforce the line and stop the bleeding. Relief. But now what? The Romans were fighting for their lives and operating entirely without a plan. Pharnaces had a whole bunch of chariots at his disposal, which mm. apparently had been kitted out to be used as heavy cavalry. These chariots now began to crash into the weak sections of the Roman line. The Romans had not considered how to counter attacks like this, and so they had no choice but to ignore the chariots for the time being. The only thing that the Romans really had going for them was the fact that they were fighting downhill. 
they basically leaned into this advantage. I mean, that should be a massive advantage. But of course, uh, they were kind of surprised by their opposing force, and the Romans always seemed to struggle when pitted against chariots. I'm not sure how it, it seemed... I know chariots were a common aspect of uh, ancient, like, Bronze Age warfare. They seem to have sort of gone out of style at this point. They don't seem super common, but you do see them dotted around, uh, around here in Britain, and the Romans always uh, seemed to be surprised when they faced them and began to use brute force to push forward as best they could. Mm. As the day wore on, the Romans were able to push Pharnaces' army all the way down the hill. Of course, now, if they keep pushing, now they're going to be pushing upwards, so that advantage is flipped into a disadvantage. Um, what I was going to say is that, you know, even though Pharnaces managed to get around Caesar's mind tricks, you know, the Romans are just as good at brute force uh, as any of their opponents, so if you want to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, they can do that too. Suddenly, there was an unexpected breakthrough on the Roman right. Oh, the wow. Romans immediately rushed in to fill the gap. It wasn't very long before Pharnaces' center collapsed as well, which wow. sent the entire army into full flight. Pharnaces would be dead within a matter of days. His successors offered Caesar their unconditional surrender. Okay, I honestly did not expect that to end so quickly and so decisively, but there you go. Um, Pharnaces went for his strategy. I do appreciate it, but it didn't work. Uh, the Romans managed to push back with some simple brute force, uh, and they took the day. They won the battle, uh, and they completely defeated Pharnaces and his empire. Everybody, including Caesar, had assumed that the reconquest of Asia Minor would be a year or years long grind. In the end, the entire campaign was over in something like five days. Shocking. <laughs> wow. But as we've seen, this victory had very little to do with Caesar, and everything to do with Pharnaces' recklessness. Yeah, but that can still look pretty damn impressive if you're Julius Caesar and you send notice back to Rome. And, you know, I've mentioned this before, Caesar was excellent at PR. I mean, one of his top skills was marketing himself. This is why he was such a good politician. Um, you know, if Caesar sends back uh, to the bulletin boards in Rome, hey, uh, or the street criers or however they communicated their news, I, I think they had street criers. Um, yeah, I, I defeated this enemy in five days. Y'all thought it would take a year. Uh, I've done it in less than a week. That's incredibly impressive uh, and definitely shows Caesar's authority, his power, and that's an important thing to do. That being said, Caesar was never one to squander a propaganda opportunity, and exactly. so in his next report to the Senate, he wrote an open letter, which simply contained the following words. Wany, weedy, weaky. This is usually translated as, I came, I saw, I conquered. And you might notice that he's pronouncing the V's as W's, because that's how they would have been pronounced uh, in ancient Latin. You know, a, a lot of us would pronounce the V's, but it's actually pronounced with the W. He also had pamphlets distributed in Rome that pointed out how Pompey's eastern campaign had taken years, <laughs> while his had taken days. Yep. Cheeky. Brilliant propaganda. Caesar had dealt with the first major crisis, but his work wasn't done. Roman politics were still spinning out of control, and the Pompeians mm. in North Africa were still gearing up for a brand new civil war. It would be impossible for any long-term planning to take place. Until I am curious, maybe we'll find out, like, what are the Pompeians planning? Pompey is gone. Um, they've got Cato with them. Like, what is Cato thinking? You know, Caesar is pretty dominant at this point. I know he had a bad time in Egypt, but... He managed to beat Pompey. He controls a lot of territory. You know, it's not like he's entirely in control of Roman territory. They hold North Africa. Uh, and, you know, Caesar has pretty loose control over the rest of Roman territory. But even still, you know, I would think that they really don't have that much of a chance to resist Caesar at this point. Until these issues were dealt with. Caesar set sail for Italy. He had been away for nearly three years. Wow. Along the way, he decided that his next priority would be the Pompeians in North Africa. 
the Roman Civil War had already ended once with Pompey's murder. That probably should have been the end of hostilities, but for yeah. whatever reason, maybe Caesar's inattentiveness, maybe the quality of the Pompeian leadership, the old order was able to re-establish itself in North Africa. Curious, so Historius Civilis says for whatever reason, um, gives a couple of suggestions, maybe... Um, well, maybe we're not entirely sure. Um, I'm curious what you guys think, or if you have any further information on why the Civil War sort of dragged on after this. Uh, or, sorry, after the death of Poppy is what I mean. And set the stage for a second Civil War. Caesar started to make preparations for a crossing to North Africa. During his time, Caesar kept himself busy by issuing instructions to his allies back in Rome. I'm not going to get into Roman politics right now, because if I do, we're all going to turn into Zardoz skeletons, oh. but we'll circle back to this when the time's right. Okay. I, I really enjoy political history. I love Roman politics, so I, I always like to see more. One thing that I do need to mention here is that Caesar had a legion mutiny on him. Uh -oh. The reason for this is that Caesar had made significant promises to his oldest legions if they would agree to delay their retirement until after the Civil War. I remember. That had been several years ago. Now, after winning the Civil War... Ca well, I mean, Caesar's been fighting for such a long time, and I guess he's gained control of the Empire largely, but he hasn't really gained too much yet. He hasn't truly established his dominance... He hasn't really reaped the spoils of the war uh, due to his sort of struggle in Egypt, and then he took a bit of a vacation with Cleopatra. So I imagine, even though Caesar has, you know, won the first civil war against Pompey, he hasn't really been able to hand out the rewards that these legionaries expected. Caesar had delivered on exactly zero of his promises, and was now gearing up for yet another campaign. They yeah. were right to be upset. Caesar went out to meet the mutineers, and after an emotional back and forth, he told them that for their loyalty over the years, they were free to retire whenever they wished. Wow. This unconditional offer came as a shock to the mutineers. Caesar followed this up by humbly asking if they would consider going on one last campaign with him. <laughs> after that, they could retire in peace, and he would devote the next years of his life to fulfilling every one of his promises. Upon receiving that specific commitment, the mutineers agreed to go on. I mean, you can definitely imagine uh, a movie version of that. It, you know, it's very dramatic. The, the mutineers frustrated. Caesar comes to them humbly, tells them, you can go if you want, but I need you guys for one more ride. <laughs> it's very cinematic in a way. Uh, a lot of, I mean, a lot of history is, a lot of Roman history is, one, because there were a lot of crazy events. Two, because when the historians write about it, they, you know, make their own narratives. Uh, Roman historians are sort of famous for doing that. Uh, and those narratives, um, you know, they weren't entirely accurate. We have to draw the objective information out of the way they presented the history, which was in many ways largely subjective uh, and sometimes just blatantly fictional. <laughs> One last campaign. Time was of the essence. The mutiny had shown Caesar that his most experienced legions would not tolerate any more dilly-dallying. Yeah. A plan was hatched to set sail with whatever legions were ready to go. The rest would just have to catch up whenever they could. It was customary for the Romans to kick off a voyage like this with an animal sacrifice. Mm. On this occasion, the bull selected for the sacrifice had an IQ of like a million. And so when it caught sight of the knife, it got all turned up and was able to break free of its restraints. <laughs> when the Romans tried to calm the bull down, it zigged and then it zagged and then it booked it off into the distance, becoming the freest bull who ever lived. I mean, shout out to that bull. Uh, he, he earned his freedom, but that seems uh, religiously, uh, from the Roman perspective, like a bad sign. This wasn't a great omen, but whatever. The fleet set sail on... Uh-oh. I mean, we saw that guy in his, uh, Oversimplified's videos on the First Punic War who kept ignoring the bad omens, uh, and things did not go well for him. Schedule. But here's the thing. 
The Romans were notoriously bad sailors, and oh, during yes. the crossing, ill winds blew the entire fleet wildly off course. After several stressful days at sea, only a small fraction of Caesar's original fleet remained. When the group caught sight of land, they decided to make camp on the beach so that the rest of the fleet could track them down. But when Caesar came ashore, his foot got caught on the lip of the boat, and he fell face first oh. onto the beach. Oh, that's just humiliating. Thinking quickly, he bounced to his feet with his hands full of pebbles and shouted for the benefit of his soldiers, Africa, I have hold of you now. Okay, that, that's pretty smart. Like we said, Caesar master of propaganda. Uh, but the very fact we know that he tripped, uh, I think means that probably a lot of the men there didn't really buy it. They were, I'm sure they probably thought the same thing we did, which was, okay, that, that's a pretty good save, but you still tripped uh, and fell off your boat. It's also pretty remarkable that, you know, we watched that Punic War video from Oversimplified, uh, and the Romans really built up their navy several times for that, uh, and yet it's been hundreds of years since then, and the Romans are really not much better at sailing. Um, they have more experience, they certainly do have more of a permanent fleet, but they're still bad sailors, and that's just because, you know, the Roman lifestyle uh, and how they built their empire was over land. So even if they had far more naval experience, it, it still wasn't that important to them. You know, they were still primarily a land-based empire, and most of their enemies fought against them on land. So they still didn't have too much use for uh, an impressive navy. Uh, they would at some points throughout their history, um, but not really at this point. After Pompey's death, the senator Cato seized control of the Pompeian faction and pledged to raise new armies and restart the civil war in North Africa as soon as possible. Cato was not a military guy, and so he handed command of the Pompeian army over to a guy named Scipio, who, mm. yes, was a descendant of that other Scipio from the Second Punic War. Wow, uh, there you go, the Second Punic War is getting a reference. And we'll learn all about that earlier Scipio when Oversimplified releases uh, his videos on the Second Punic War. But, uh, yeah, it's pretty remarkable to get uh, a descendant of that, that great general. Um, though I do have to say to Cato, like, just why, man? Are you really going to endure further bloodshed and strife for your country so that you can, what, defeat Caesar? Like, I don't know. I just feel like it's over, you know? Uh, in retrospect, we can tell it's over, but I think even those who were there, I mean, Cicero knew, you know, he, he, you know, just left the Pompeian faction. He realized it was over. Um, I, I just think this is some, you know, odd arch conservative fanaticism, uh, some unbending desire to defeat Caesar, even when I, I really don't think it's worth it. In fact, there was a rumor going around saying that according to prophecy, it was impossible to defeat Escipio in North Africa. Huh. No such prophecy existed, but the rumor persisted anyway. Caesar was aware that this could be a damaging piece of propaganda, and so he plucked a distant Scipio cousin out of obscurity and threw him into the military equivalent of middle <laughs> management. Well, see, like we said, Caesar knows his propaganda. The last major Pompeian that we should be aware of is Caesar's old right-hand man Labinus, wow. who was serving as one of Scipio's officers. Can't believe Labinus is also stuck around, although it might be a little more personal for him. What's weird about this is that Labinus was undeniably the better general, but mm. Cato preferred Scipio due to his conservative politics and his prestigious family name. Mm. Cato was also able to solicit the support of a Roman ally. King Juba of Numidia, who brought his world-class Numidian cavalry to the yeah. Pompeian cause. We've seen those Numidian cavalry before. Uh, they are, like Histori Sevilla said, world-class. Uh, so that's uh, that's a good ally to have. Uh, also, can you imagine if it was, if Labinus was in charge, it was Labinus versus Caesar? I mean, now, you know, we just talked about cinematic moments. That would be a cinematic moment, a truly uh, movie-worthy uh, battle between those two. Back on the beach, most of the scattered Caesarian fleet had been able to track Caesar down, but there was already a problem. 
In their haste to cross the Mediterranean, the Caesareans brought virtually no food with them. I, I, I should have known. Caesar's thing, one of his things, seems to be that he just loves being in enemy territory, hostile territory, without any food or supplies. Now, being facetious, of course he doesn't actually want that. But he really seems to end up in these situations often where he's surrounded by hostile territory uh, and he's got like little to no food. Um, I suppose that shows how ambitious a general he was. He was always venturing out into enemy territory, but it's kind of interesting that he always ends up in this position. This seems like bad planning, and it was, but the legions had kind of forced Caesar to set sail before the invasion was 100% uh. ready. So th this one wasn't entirely his fault. Food and reinforcements were coming, they just weren't here yet. In the meantime, they would just have to live off the land. Great. When King Juba of the Numidians became aware of this weakness, he immediately launched a series of raids along the coast. This activity made foraging virtually impossible. Smart. One of these raids has a real truth is stranger than fiction quality to it, so if you'll indulge me, I'll include it here. All right, go Caesar's ahead. army included a bunch of Gallic cavalry, and these dudes were sitting around a fire one night, talking, maybe drinking, whatever, when out of the darkness, a North African local approached the fire and began playing the flute and doing a little dance. <laughs> the Gallic cavalry dudes were super impressed by this, and a small crowd gathered to watch the performance. <laughs> the purpose of the music and of the crowd was to drown out the sound of hooves. King Juba's Numidian cavalry charged out of the darkness, right into the crowd. What? Before the Roman camp could respond, the Numidians slipped away. I mean, I don't know if that is true, but if it is, that is quite a remarkable series of events. You send your little flute player in to do a jig and play his flute uh, for the purpose of a distraction. I mean, that's some good thinking right there. Raids like this were a daily threat, which was super frustrating. Caesar decided to change things up by taking half of his army and marching inland to capture a few North African desert towns. Remember, he didn't necessarily need to defeat the Pompeians immediately, he just needed to keep his army fed until reinforcements arrived. Capturing yeah. a town or two would accomplish that. A few kilometers into the desert, the Caesareans noticed a dust cloud coming up behind them. It was the entire Numidian army, under the command of Caesar's old right-hand man, Labinus. Damn. The Caesareans turned and prepared for the fight of their lives. Okay, well, there you go. Labinus isn't leading the Pompeian faction, but we are still getting uh, the showdown between Caesar and his former right-hand man. Marching inland had been a huge mistake. Labinus had a ton of cavalry with him, and- I mean, Caesar is clearly the more talented general. Uh, like, I don't even think that's a debate. But he has been caught in a bad situation. Labinus is far more prepared to fight this battle than Caesar is. He used this to his advantage by having them ride out and occupy all of the hills surrounding Caesar's position. He knew that Caesar was uniquely good at playing up small tactical differences, and with yeah. this one move, he took that option off the table. Given the size and makeup of Labinus's army, Caesar was primarily concerned with being flanked, and so he deployed his infantry in a long, thin line. Labinus and the Numidians advanced, and as they did so, their cavalry fanned out wider and wider and wider. <sighs> Uh -oh. Only now did it become clear that Labinus had been hiding his numbers by packing his cavalry tightly together. Caesar was much more badly outnumbered than originally thought. Hey, I mean, I said Caesar is the more talented general, and I absolutely stand by that, but given the advantages he has, Labinus is playing this very intelligently. You know, clearly, um, he knows how to play against Caesar's tricks, which isn't surprising. He served with him for years but he is sort of the perfect counter to all of Caesar's uh, advantages and tricks uh, and sort of, you know, stuff that he does to help him win. Then, Labinus attacked everywhere at once. Infantry in the center, cavalry on the wings. 
Caesar's line was already as wide and as thin as possible, so they were unable to stop the Numidian cavalry on the wings. Oh no. Before too long, the Caesarians were completely encircled. Caesar turned every other cohort around so that they could face attacks from two directions at once, but this didn't do much good. Labinus's cavalry refused to let themselves get pinned down. They attacked, wheeled, attacked again, threw javelins, shot arrows, mm. basically behaved as unpredictably as possible. The Caesarians had no answer to tactics like this, and as the day wore on, they began to waver. Yeah, I mean, you know, Caesar has mostly infantry. Um, the, the Roman armies always consisted of primarily infantry. They always struggled with cavalry, uh, and this is why often they use auxiliaries for cavalry, uh, you know, foreign allies like the Numidians uh, or different, you know, tribal allies throughout Europe. Um, and you were, we're sort of seeing that here, the very skilled Numidian cavalry up against the Roman infantry, and they're really not sure how to deal with it. They're at a big disadvantage. During a break in the fighting, Labinus took off his helmet and rode up and down the front line. He began to taunt the Caesarian soldiers, shouting things like, How is it going, recruit? Don't you boys look dashing. Wow. Caesar sure led you into a dangerous situation. Wish I could help. Okay, there's clearly some resentment there. I think we already knew that, but clearly some resentment from Labinus to Caesar, because he is really rubbing it in. Mind you, Labinus would have known many of these soldiers by name, making yeah. these taunts all the more biting. Jeez. Labinus knew the truth. He was winning the battle. Caesar was losing. It was only a matter of time. Caesar came up with a radical plan. On his signal, he had the legions throw their javelins and charge in both directions at once. Mm. Labinus's encircling cavalry didn't want to be pinned down, so they wheeled and pulled back. This created an opening. Caesar ordered an immediate withdrawal. But it wasn't that simple. The Caesarians moved as quickly as possible, but it wasn't long before Labinus's Numidian cavalry caught up to them. Mm. Caesar's exhausted legions turned and prepared to fight the second battle of the day. Jeez. As Labinus and the Numidians closed in. I mean, I think Caesar's playing it as well as he can. Um, he doesn't have any advantages, so he's trying to act quickly and decisively. But even still, I mean, this is a pretty brutal slog. The men have got to be getting, you know, pretty exhausted at this point. The Caesarians went on the offensive. The infantry charged and refused to let the Numidians take the initiative. Wow. Labinus's Numidian cavalry continued to hit the Caesarians with javelins. Hey, so even despite them being tired and probably dealing with some casualties, some significant casualties, uh, Caesar is continuing, you know, trying to make these quick and rapid decisions to throw Labinus off. Uh, and he's just going for it. Um, you know, he knows what he's doing, obviously. He's Julius Caesar, come on. ...and arrows, but were forced to pull further and further back as the Caesarians continued to advance. During this onslaught, Labinus was probably thrown from his horse and injured. <laughs> the Caesarians abrupt... You know, uh, I mean, look, I don't judge a lot of these people necessarily... Um, I didn't really have much of an opinion on Labinus. He's certainly very skilled. But after that riding up and down and taunting, it is a little satisfying to see him being thrown from his horse. Kind of feels like he deserved it a little bit. You know, don't get too cocky, man. Abruptly turned and began their second withdrawal of the day. Labinus was probably no longer in command, and whoever succeeded him chose to let the Caesarians go. Hmm. Some historians criticize this decision, but bear in mind that the other half of Caesar's army was only a few kilometers away. If the Numidians chased Caesar all the way back to the coast, they would almost certainly run into them. Yeah, I think in that situation, it's kind of a toss-up. You know, they let the Caesarians go. What would have happened if they tried to chase them? Well, perhaps they could have won uh, a stunning victory, truly defeating Caesar once and for all, or perhaps it could have gone badly. Uh, and they would have been defeated if once Caesar had been reinforced, or Caesar would have managed to uh, retreat again, or I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't, maybe it was a bad decision, but, but to me it seems much more like a toss-up. You wouldn't have known which way it was going to go. 
much better to just take the win and let them go. Labinus had just defeated his old friend in open battle. The myth yeah. surrounding Caesar's skill as a general had been forever tarnished. Labinus wow. must have been pretty happy with himself. Yeah, I mean, I get that, but to be fair, uh, definitely some mistakes were made along the way by Caesar, but, you know, I think given the situation he was in, uh, low on supplies, which seems like it wasn't necessarily his fault, he performed pretty admirably. Um, you know, he was uh, had a lot of disadvantages. Um, Labinus held all the hills. He had the superior forces, um, you know, in terms of the skill. He had that skilled cavalry. Uh, and in terms of a numerically superior force, I think Caesar did a pretty good job in a losing situation. The Caesareans returned to the coast, exhausted, demoralized, hungry, and unsure as to what to do next. So long as Labinus continued to patrol the desert, any further inland incursions would be impossible. Mm. Months passed. The wow. Caesareans spent this time huddled together in a defensive crouch on the coast. The only thing that kept them from starving was the fact that they found a hidden food stockpile belonging to a nearby town. You know, it honestly is remarkable sometimes, and I feel like it's worth pointing out, because uh, I think sometimes we forget this, these stretches of time that go on between some of these major battles. To us, it might not seem like that long, because we're, you know, watching a video or reading a book about the topic, uh, and, you know, say the battle gets five minutes or, you know, 15 pages in the book, and then this period of, like, five months gets almost no time, and then back to the next battle. But it's worth remembering that between all of these crazy events, you know, the Caesarian troops, um, and this doesn't just apply to them, this applies to a lot of warfare, both ancient and modern, the troops are just, you know, huddling up, camping out, trying to find food, just surviving for months on end before they get to any major engagements. Um, that, you know, that is a lot of this time. Uh, it just feels like it's sort of worth pointing out. Otherwise, the military dynamic remained unchanged. No word on the reinforcements from Italy. I mean, that's why, uh, you know, Caesar's first campaign in this video um, against that foreign king was expected to take a year. Because, um, you know, they usually don't just fight until someone's defeated. You know, there's long stretches of tracking each other and camping out. The difference was that they fought one battle... Caesar won, and that was it. That's why it only took five days. This is playing out much more like a traditional, average military conflict. Over this period, a daily ritual developed, where Scipio would deploy for battle just outside the Caesarian camp, and Caesar would decline the offer. <laughs> Caesar feared that an attack may happen at any time, and in desperation brought all of his sailors down off the ships, and pressed them into the infantry. Mm. You might be asking yourself why Scipio didn't attack at this time. There's a good reason. Scipio's basic military strategy said that a stalemate in North Africa was basically as good as a victory. The Pompeians correctly assessed that Caesar's political support was shallow and believed that a prolonged North African campaign would shatter Caesar's reputation and allow Pompeian politicians to reassert themselves back in Rome. Yeah. I think that's absolutely true, as we talked about. You know, despite Caesar winning the civil war with Pompey, um, he doesn't hold too much political support. He's not dominant uh, over the empire yet. So if he's in a position where he can't assert himself over Rome, uh, he's stuck in North Africa, uh, and not to mention he's either at a stalemate or losing, you know, I think it's a fair assumption that Pompeians could arise throughout the empire and Pompeian politicians could take control back in Rome. You know, Caesar really has not been able to reap the benefits of his victory over Pompey. He hasn't been able to establish his control. So he's sort of stuck in this dangerous situation right now. Uh, he's going to have to find some way out of this, uh, ideally defeating the remaining Pompeians as quickly as possible and then heading back to Rome to assert himself. Say what you will about Scipio, but his strategy was coherent. At long last, those reinforcements from Italy showed up. Two additional legions, bringing Caesar's total up to rough parity with Scipio at eight legions apiece. 
Okay. Caesar was still technically outnumbered if you counted King Juba's four additional legions, but at least now Caesar could get out of his defensive crouch. Caesar surprised Scipio by marching off and seizing a set of nearby hills. Labinus kept up the pressure by launching a series of hit-and-run cavalry raids. The pressure worked, because after a day or so, Caesar abandoned the hills and advanced on a nearby town in hopes of restocking on food. Scipio wisely put his army in between the Caesareans and the town, and Caesar was forced to pull back. This wow, okay. You know, I was thinking when those reinforcements arrived, maybe Scipio and Labinus shouldn't have just waited, but they're really playing all their cards correctly. Uh, I mean, they're doing this game of maneuvering around each other, you know, playing mind tricks, trying to predict what the other side is going to do. Uh, and right now, Scipio and Labinus are winning. You know, they're preventing Caesar from doing uh, what he intends to do. Uh, they're preventing him from gaining any further advantages. So I'm really curious to see how Caesar manages to fight his way out of this. The Caesareans were running out of options, and the Pompeians were slowly tightening their grip. But Caesar was in for some luck. Two more legions arrived in North Africa, bringing his total up to 10. Now Caesar began to act more aggressively. Mm. Both. Well, once again, you know, to be a, a, a great man or a great figure throughout history, you need many things. You need skill, talent. What you also need is luck. You need a lot of luck to be one of these great leaders throughout history. Uh, Caesar has shown us this many times. He's certainly a skilled fella, but he has used a lot of luck to get where he is. Armies deployed on favorable ground, but neither side wanted to be the one to initiate battle. The Caesareans turned and marched away. The Pompeian army followed. Finally, Caesar and his legions approached the coastal city of Thapsus and ah. began building siege equipment. It's unclear how serious Caesar was about actually storming the city, but he knew that the threat of doing so might push Scipio into attacking. The Pompeians closed in. Scipio encamped on the west. King Juba encamped on the south. Caesar would have to attack one of these positions if he wanted to withdraw again. I mean, look, I know Caesar has brought more legions in, but with the assistance of King Juba, and I absolutely think his men should be counted, he's still outnumbered by the Pompeians, not to mention that, you know, King Juba has that very skilled Numidian cavalry. So I think Caesar is still in a dangerous position here. And the two armies deployed opposite each other. Each side occupied favorable ground, and just like before, each wanted the other to attack first. Scipio and King Juba and Labinus deployed with infantry in the center and cavalry on the wings. King Juba controlled 60 war elephants, and Scipio placed them in front of the line on the wings. Ooh. These elephants would pose a unique challenge for the Caesareans. And now the Caesareans are facing elephants. The Pompeians just keep stacking their advantages. The Pompeians had a significant cavalry advantage, which made it pretty obvious where most of the action would be. Caesar moved his strongest and most experienced legions to the wings. In fact, there was a lot of internal debate as to who would get the honor of facing off against the elephants. Hmm. In the end, Caesar tapped the veteran 5th legion who had served under him in Gaul and- I mean, look, that's the attitude you want from your soldiers. Uh, that is the attitude of a true warrior. It's not, well, I don't want to fight the elephant. That's extra dangerous. It's who gets the honor of facing the elephants. You know, I'll do it, I'll do it. The best of the best, they all want to be given that honor to fight the toughest battle of the day. Uh, that's a good attitude for your legionaries to have. And put them on elephant duty on each wing. For most of the day, the two armies just stared at each other. Whoever attacked first would be at a slight disadvantage and nobody wanted to take that risk. Hmm. There are several different versions of what happened next. It all has to do with Caesar's veterans. Remember, Caesar had promised that this would be their last campaign. For months, they had suffered humiliation after humiliation at the hands of Labinus and others. Yeah, that's a pretty tough last campaign. It's not uh, quite the glory they were imagining, I suspect. And now, retirement was one decisive battle away. They were grumpy and impatient. The veterans on Caesar's right attacked without orders. 
later, they would claim that they detected a weakness in Scipio's line, but I don't buy it. Mm. It's worth mentioning here that one account claims that Caesar suffered from a seizure earlier in the day and Whoa. spent several hours recovering in his tent. If this happened, it would explain some of the miscommunication going on here. Caesar suffered from seizures for his entire life, but this... Fascinating. I never knew that. I never knew he suffered from seizures. Um, and also, yeah, I, Caesar usually has a lot more control. Uh, I guess we don't know truly whether he was there or not. If he was there, you know, I would be surprised that his men were so out of control and so rowdy that they just acted on their own. It's possible, but it, it does seem like, you know, him having a seizure and being out of commission is perhaps more likely uh, to explain why, uh, you know, his legion has just acted on their own. This is the only instance where his condition may have directly impaired his ability to command. When Caesar discovered that his right had moved to attack, he ordered the veterans to get back in line, but these orders were ignored. Wow. The right made contact with the enemy, and more and more neighboring units moved in to help. So he truly was losing control over his men. It quickly became clear that the battle could not be stopped. Caesar ordered an all-out attack and rode forward to personally take command of the endangered right. All right, then. Nothing too complicated. Uh, Caesar's men went on their own volition, and he has been forced to follow. Uh, instead of a general leading his army, this is the army leading the general. So now Caesar just has to, you know, ride up and try and win this battle. Scipio's elephants charged. Caesar's legions had trained for this and opened up holes in their line so that the elephants could pass mm. through unharmed. Classic. The fifth legion was waiting, spears in hand, just- Yep, this is some classic elephant strategy. Behind the Caesarian line. Their only job today would be to face this elephant charge head on. The battle dragged on for hours. The veterans on Caesar's left and right repulsed Labina- It's honestly pretty crazy and I think Caesar's gonna win this. It's a pretty remarkable victory when you think about, it feels like the Pompeians are just stacking advantages. You know, they've got, you know, all their infantry, they've got this skilled cavalry, they've got these elephants, uh, and Caesar has, you know, basically primarily just got infantry. He's got some cavalry, but, you know, he's got his men fighting the Pompeian men, his cavalry are far outnumbered, uh, and fighting against the elephants, he just has his infantry. So the Romans are really just... Well, sorry, not the Romans, the Caesareans. They're really just putting a lot of effort in. Uh, you know, they're putting some gusto in and hoping to win this one. And this is cavalry again and again and again. The 5th Legion held their own against the elephants, but one source describes a horrific scene with elephants throwing soldiers with their trunks and Ugh. stomping on anybody who fell to the ground. Nightmare stuff. Hours passed and the sun began to set. Bloodied and bruised, the 5th Legion threw one last volley of javelins, which at last caused the war elephants to panic and flee. What followed was absolute chaos. The elephants crashed straight into the Pompeii. Yup, and we talked about this in the Punic War video. You know, elephants are uh, a pretty incredible asset to have, but they come with a massive risk, high risk, high reward. If your enemy can manage to frighten the elephants or turn them around, they're going to go charging right back through your ranks, and they're going to cause chaos and destruction amongst your own men. That's the risk that comes with war elephants, and now we're seeing the effects of that. Um, that might bring this battle to an end. I mean, that's how destructive it can be. ...in line, causing it to crumble. Those yep. who held their ground quickly fell under a renewed push from Caesar's legions. The Caesareans then descended into what can only be described as a killing frenzy, where many thousands of disarmed Pompeian prisoners were murdered on the spot. Look, I can't say I'm surprised. We talked about their frustration, the humiliating campaign, um, but obviously this is not a good thing. I mean, this sort of massacre is never good. But consider that these are their fellow Romans. Throughout the Civil War, Caesar has sort of um, tried to be more merciful than he would be when facing foreign enemies. He's tried to avoid burning towns, 
killing civilians because he knows that he has to rule the empire once this is over, right? You know, if you go around making enemies, nobody's going to like you when you're the victor of the conflict. So this is, uh, I would say, some rare brutality from this conflict, but nonetheless, a pretty sad show of brutality against fellow countrymen. Um, so, you know, you never like to see this sort of thing. Caesar frantically issued orders telling the legions to leave the prisoners alone, but these were just outright ignored. I mean, and I guess credit to Caesar that he wants to prevent this. I just mentioned how he had been more merciful. Um, so we can see that here. He doesn't want this to happen, but I mean, he hardly had control of his men during the battle. There's not a chance he's going to have control of them now. Caesar completely lost control of his army. Yeah. By the time the madness passed, virtually no prisoners were left alive. Uh, that's sad. In the days that followed, Scipio and King Juba of the Numidians would take their own lives. Wow. Labinus, ever resourceful, was able to escape with some survivors and set sail for Spain, where he vowed to continue the fight. You know, once upon a time, Caesar's right-hand man has become one of his strongest and most resilient enemies. He will not give up. But, of course, Labinus and Scipio were not the leaders of the Pompeian faction. That man was Cato, who was yep. headquartered in the nearby town of Utica. When Cato learned of the resounding Pompeian defeat at Thapsus, he took his own life. The details surrounding Cato's death have been highly romanticized, which I don't want to play into here. However, this incident would become famous within Caesar's lifetime, and so I should mention it in passing. Cato stabbed himself in the stomach, inexplicably survived, and then later ripped open his stitches and disemboweled himself with his bare hands. It was Jesus. a gruesome death. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with not wanting to romanticize that. It's gruesome, it's pretty horrific. And in addition, you know, to be honest, I have no love lost for Cato. Uh, I never really respected him that much. Um, you know, I just, he was just not a practical figure. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like no matter what you personally thought of, say, someone like Cicero, you could at least respect that he acted practically, and I feel like he tried to do what was best. I never felt that way about Cato. So, you know, you don't want to romanticize such a brutal death, and I, I just, I, you know, I just really didn't like Cato that much. Um, at least from Historia Civilis' presentation, right? Uh, that, I'll put it that way. With the passing of Cato, the Roman Civil War ended for the second time. Although Labinus and other Pompeians survived, it's safe to say that for the first time, Caesar was in full control of Roman territory. He was finally free to return to the city of Rome and begin the hard work of forging a lasting peace. Wow. If such a thing was even possible. Kinda. <laughs> All right. You always got to let the outro play a little bit. A lasting peace? It's kind of possible. I mean, Caesar does get assassinated in the end, so, you know, you can sort of make of that what you will. And I'm seeing that the next video is Rome's new political order. Um, so I'm really excited to get to that one. Because like I said, I really enjoy the uh, uh, Roman political system and political history in general. I really enjoyed this one. Uh, we got to see Caesar, you know, finally sort of clean up the civil war. Ho hopefully we can put this behind us now uh, and move on to Caesar's reign uh, over the empire. I'm really excited to see how that goes. Um... If you guys enjoyed this one, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.